We're going to read some words written by the second greatest missionary who ever lived on planet Earth, and that was the Apostle Paul. A lot of people say he's the greatest missionary, but I believe Jesus was a missionary. If a simple definition of a missionary is one who leaves his place to go to another place and bring the gospel, that's who Jesus is. He is the greatest missionary ever. Uh, So Paul became the second greatest. I often think what Paul could have done with the technology we have today. Paul had um, sandals, maybe a donkey every now and then, a ship. He didn't have real good luck with ships. Uh, My wife and I just got off of a ship. It's a long story. We went on what my grandkids now call Papa and Mimi's Big Adventure. Three weeks ago, we were, uh, a little little more than three weeks ago, we were leaving San Juan, Puerto Rico on a ship. And there arose a great storm called (laughs) Eurocladon, called Maria. And we ran from that bird for nine days. And uh, I don't want to keep you in suspense. We lived. (laughs) We got home. And uh, we we were thankful. In a moment, I'm going to read to you some words about uh, Paul. You would imagine that a man right smack in the middle of God's will for his life and serving God probably more ferociously than anyone who ever has would never have a hiccup, would never need Dr. Martin, would never have a shipwreck, would never get persecuted, would never get beaten, would never get thrown into jail. But there he was, and I appreciated Pastor Tony's message last night because no matter where you are and what you're going through, God is always in control of the whole situation, including what we call bad ones. And so for a few minutes tonight, I want to speak to you on why I believe the future is bright. Now, we're about encouragement, right? At this conference, we want to revive and encourage. And so uh, you hear so many naysayers today about the future of our country and the future of society and the future of culture and the future of the world. And I want to flip that around 180 and tell you why I believe the future is bright. Before I do that, I want, can I tell you my, one of my favorite Dr. Wally stories? This is kind of Dr. Wally night. And we, I have so many of them. He and I shared a wonderful common love of aviation. It's a long story, but we shared a great love for it. And he loved coming to my house. My wife would often send me to pick him up at the motor home. It was one of those times he avoided Burger King, McDonald's, and Wendy's. And she would make dinner. Now, I grew up in the South, in, in Tennessee. Any Tennesseans? Oh, I don't know why I'm even here. Uh, and uh, my wife is also a country cook, and he would love, she would make meatloaf and mashed potatoes and green beans and biscuits and, and always a dessert. She'd ask me to ask him what he'd like to have, and uh, he absolutely loved it. And we would sit there until on Saturday night, he would start to fall asleep and have to take him back so he could get some rest. But he would tell me stories and spin yarns, and he told me one story about a dead stick landing, the only time he ever landed his plane without engine power. Uh, trying to get back to Texas. And it was a fascinating story to hear him tell that. But my favorite one involved a time that, you know, Bema's office at one time was at the Akron Baptist Temple. Did you know that, Pastor Tony? Baptist Temple, when Dr. Charles was there, they had a Bema office and they had an airplane at Akron Kenton Airport. And at that time, they had a twin aircraft. And uh, he and Dr. Charles decided they were going to go hit some of the islands where we had missionaries, the Caribbean islands. And that's not a real difficult for, for uh, an experienced pilot in a twin engine aircraft. And so you have to make some hops. You had to make a stop in, in Florida and refuel and head off. And he filed his flight plans. He always filed flight plans. Uh, so uh, off they went from Florida, full of fuel and on their proper flight plan and hit a storm. Now, you can't fly a small aircraft nearly as high. In fact, you can't really go much above 10,000 feet without oxygen. And so you can't fly like the airlines do. And, and so he was underneath uh, the storm, but he ran right into to a high storm coming up. And uh, they had to, he knew the area fairly well, knew where missionaries lived and where, where there were landing strips on the various islands. And a small plane can land almost anywhere there's a small airstrip. And they put down. They had to. They had no choice. They, they were hearing the chatter and, and uh, knowing the storm was going in their direction. They found an island and they put down. But uh, they could not contact home. So in the meantime, while they were enjoying the hospitality of a beautiful Caribbean island, all that the folks at Canton, or, I'm sorry, Akron Baptist Temple knew was that Dr. Wally and Dr. Charles Billington never made their island, never got there according to the flight plan, and they were hours and hours past due. And uh, by the time that they were able to get airborne again and get to another place where there was communication, 
the Akron Baptist Temple was already planning both their funerals. <laughs> and of course, when they called, at that point, a pastor wonders, are they happy or not that I'm calling? But uh, Dr. Wally was disappointed that they canceled the funeral because he was looking forward to the memorial meal at the end. <laughs> he was such a rascal. And uh, I miss him so much tonight. I miss him. Won't it be grand to be in heaven and not have to miss anybody anymore? Amen. Uh, what a joy uh, that thought is. Well, let me get to doing what Pastor Tony has asked me to do tonight. I want to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting at verse 8. We'll read to verse 18 and then we'll make a prayer. Here's what Paul has said in inspired scripture. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Did you know that's our primary purpose right there? To glorify God in our lives. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We're also, we also believe, and therefore speak. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, can you imagine Paul with all he has gone through saying that our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now let's pray one for the other, please. Heavenly Father. We thank you for your love for us, your good grace that saved us, and your grace that sustains us. And Father, I ask you to help us now for a few minutes. We all carry burdens of various sizes into this room, things that hang on our heart, weigh on our mind, and steal our attention if we allow them. And so we cast our burden on you. You said to do that, and you would sustain us. And so, Lord, for a little while, open our ears and our heart and help us to lift up our eyes and look and see there is reason to rejoice over the future. I pray for these dear ones here, Father. I am humbled in the presence of many who have served for decades upon decades. God bless them. I'm humbled by the fact that there are younger men here who are just starting out in their ministry and yet doing it boldly and with joy. And it gives me such great hope to know that if you tarry and I depart, that this work is going to go on. Thank you for that encouragement. Now, Lord, bless us and meet with us. Let us feel your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My wife and I just uh, a few weeks ago celebrated our 45th wedding anniversary. We got married when we were 10. Where I grew up in eastern Tennessee, that's allowed. We were a little bit older than that. We are children of the 60s. I started elementary school in 1959 and graduated uh, high school in 1970, as my wife did, and we grew up in turbulent times. If you know, especially North American culture in the 1960s, it was turbulent times. We survived uh, race riots and burning of ROTC buildings and, and LSD and free love and, and Woodstock and peace marches and the Vietnam War, and we are not supposed to be here because we were told in the 1960s that that was the end. This is the last of the culture. You guys are not going to survive. You will not live free. In this. Yet here we are tonight living as free citizens in a free land, enjoying the good blessings of God and grandparents of nine wonderful little people. Don't you love grandchildren? Do you have any? You should know if you do. Do you have any? Okay. They're so wonderful. You know, my kids are mean and terrible and awful to them, but uh, we have these wonderful grandchildren. Here we are as survivors, we children of the 60s. I want you to know that we are not the only Christian believers ever to face difficult times. Are the times difficult? Everybody knows the answer to that. Of course they are. They're difficult in different ways right now than used to be 25, 30, even 40 years ago when my ministry was in its early stages. Difficult times, but we're not the only ones. What did Paul just say? We're troubled, pressured, not distressed. He said we're not confined. 
We're perplexed, which means at a loss, but not in despair. He said, I'm not hopeless. We're persecuted, which means pursued, but not forsaken. We're not alone. And then he said, we're cast down. I've been knocked down, Paul said, but I've not been destroyed. Let me read you something written by William Barclay, the Scottish preacher and writer. He said, the supreme characteristic of the Christian is not that he does not fall, but that every time he falls, he rises again. It is not that he's never beaten, but he's never ultimately defeated. He may lose a battle, but he knows in the end he can never lose the campaign. And so I want to take just a moment and tell you why practical, logical reasons why I know the future is bright. Here's the first one. Are you ready? I got to wait for you. If you're not ready, I'm just going to go back to the remote room and get some sleep. Are you ready? All right, good, 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 good. Here it is. Number one, this is such good logic. Here it is. Because the day we live in is so dark. Does that make sense to anybody but me? You see, what are we? We are light bearers, are we not? Jesus said, uh, John said, Jesus was the light that came into the world to light every man. And then Jesus said, you are in my place, the light of the world. Well, if we're the light of the world, where do we best do our business? In the dark. And the darker it is, the brighter the light shines. Anybody ever been to Mammoth Cave, Kentucky? Have you? Good, good, good. I stopped there uh, with my kids when they were little folks so many years ago, and we took that tour, and we went way down in the cavern. And, of course, there's walk lights and path lights and beautiful colored lights on the stalactites and the stalagmites. Does anybody know the difference between the two? It really doesn't matter, does it? I, I, I know. One drips up and one drips down. But uh, we got way down in the belly of the earth, and the guy that was guiding us knew where the hidden switch was. And he said, everybody stand still. He went over and flipped the switch, and I mean it was dark like I've never known dark. It was Egyptian dark. You could feel it. It was so, there was no ambient light of any kind. It was so dark and it was quite disconcerting to be dark like that. Now everybody sit still. Don't be alarmed. I've asked Richard to help us. Uh, He tells me he can make it dark in here. Let's make it dark in here. Okay. That's pretty good. Now, there's still ambient light. You see that? We still have light bleeding in through the windows and from the different electronic equipment. But but here's something really scary. You ready? Now, that's scary, isn't it? Isn't that scary? But this is what our guide did. He put the flashlight on himself, and as soon as he put the light on, it began to be a little more cheery. Now, I gave a lot of missionaries some of these lights. Would you guys stand up and light them? Guys and gals, ladies and men, would you stand up? Just light your light. Light your light. Shine it around the house, just like I'm doing. Light up some folks. Now look at that. A moment ago, I could not see a single person, and now I can see some of you I don't even want to see. (laughs) Look at that. Now, missionaries, do you see what your calling is? Let's make it real uncomplicated. You're just a light shiner in the darkness. Somebody say amen. amen. You can turn the lights back on, Brother Richard. Thank you so much. And you can be seated. Now, as we do that and we turn these lights back on, this light makes no impact whatsoever. You see, light best impacts the darkness. You talk about a grand time for doing what we're called to do. It's right now. It's right now. Our enemy is aggressive and vicious, and he is the one who casts darkness. In fact, I'm told by uh, physicists that there's no such thing as darkness. Is that right? Did you know that? There is no such thing as darkness. You see, darkness cannot be measured. Light, we know how we measure light. We have little devices. Sometimes engineers will come in our building, and especially when we were building a building recently, and, and they, uh, they want to measure the light according to the plan of the, the, the scheme of the architect and how much light should be in various places in the room. And you can measure light, but you cannot measure darkness. Why? Because the definition of darkness is simply the absence of light. And if our world is dark, and it is, For too long, the church has not been the light we should be. But our our chore, our job, our calling, our commission is to send the light, to be the light in this world. And I'm encouraged because it's never been a better time to do what God's given me to do because the light shines brightly best in the darkness. Here's the second thing, because the God we serve is alive. You see, if we worshiped 
a crypt, if we worshiped a, a box of bones somewhere, then I would have no hope for you tonight, no hope that I could give you tonight, no encouragement about a bright future. But we don't worship a box of bones. We, we worship and serve a risen Savior. God is arranging all things according to his plan that he outlined first in the book of Genesis when he gave that first wonderful prophetic utterance that someday through the seed of the woman would come the one we know as Messiah, Christos, the Redeemer, the one who would crush the serpent's head, the one who is our deliverer. And God is busily arranging the, the world in, in, a, in, in a manner that he prescribed so that we know we can lift up our eyes and look because redemption draws nigh. Be encouraged by that. We have a living God. You look around a lot of our churches on Sunday morning, Pastor Tony, and you wouldn't know that, would you? You know, that, that verse that says, many are called and few are chosen. In our church, sometimes it looks like many are cold and few are frozen. <laughs> it really does. It really, I feel so sorry for folks. And occasionally we'll have our pastors, we'll have somebody come and say, is there something wrong with me? Brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so, they seem like they have this exuberance and this joy of the Lord in their life. And, and I say, yes, there's something wrong with you. Because that should be normal. Even in adversity, Paul said, I rejoice evermore and I rejoice always in all things. I rejoice. Why? Because he knew that his Redeemer was alive. In history, God did his best work in the most difficult of times. I think of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3. Those boys were in trouble. I've never had anybody say, let's heat the furnace up seven times hotter and throw the preacher in. They may think it. Aren't you glad that, you know, I, I used to love to read comics when I was a kid. And, of course, there's always thought bubbles that come out. And the, the, the comic writer would write the thoughts. And I'm so glad I don't see that on Sunday when I'm preaching. <laughs> so very happy, happy, happy in my ignorance. What did God do? Well, the short of the story is they were thrown in the furnace. God could have kept them out, but he let them get thrown in. I wonder sometimes about those things. They got thrown in. And then the king spent a sleepless night, and that uh, great mathematician of his court came and said, did we not throw three in the fire? He was so good, he could count the one, two, and three. Yes, we did. Why do you ask? Oh, well, there's a fourth man, and he looks like the Son of God. I heard an old black preacher one time describe, I love the way he said it. He said, how did he know he looked like the Son of God? And this preacher said, because there ain't nobody else that looks like the Son of God, but the Son of God. He knew who he was. What a great work he did. In the New Testament, Paul and Silas locked in the jail at Philippi. Were they doing anything wrong? You already know the answer is no, they weren't. In fact, they were doing exactly what God called them to do. And they were beaten and thrown in the prison and locked away. But what did they do? Well, I ain't never going back to church because the preacher hadn't come to see me. Been in jail for 12 hours and he hadn't come see me yet. <laughs> no, they didn't. They were praising God and singing and telling prisoners how to get saved. Say, how do you know they were telling prisoners how to get saved? Because outside the door was a Philippian man, a man of Philippi, a jailer, who as soon as God shook the foundations and the door fell off, he called for a lamp and fell at their feet and he said, what must I do to be saved? Where had he heard about getting saved? He was listening to the meeting going on the other side of the door. What a great thing God did and how he started the church of Philippi out of all that was going on in that horrible scene in the prison. I'm encouraged because I believe that God is at work in our nation and the nations of the world at this very moment. I believe that God is arranging the aligning of the nations as we see it in Ezekiel and Daniel and the book of the Revelation. It's exciting to read the newspaper and watch Fox. I don't watch CNN. I'm a conservative. <laughs> and I see what God is doing and it reads like this book. Our God is alive. Be encouraged. Well, here's, here's another reason. Because I see that God is stirring his people. It seems to me that God is banding together his people in a common goal of preaching Jesus and him crucified, as Paul said he was determined to do. Let me go back to our, our text and read you from uh, verse 8. Uh, I'm sorry, verse number 5. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves servants. Now, please understand, I don't want you get the wrong impression. I'm not talking about joining up with apostates and liberals who pollute the true gospel of Christ. But listen, please, listen, please. 
It's taken me 42 years of ministry and almost 65 years of life to figure this out. As, as a preacher of this book and a student of this book, as Dr. Wally so aptly described himself, and, a, and, and one who loves the Lord and wants to see people saved, the test of our fellowship is not music. The test of our fellowship is not worship service styles. It's not even foot washing and things like baptism. Else, why did Paul say in verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Wouldn't you like to have names like that? I've dedicated a lot of babies in four decades. I've never, I've never dedicated a Crispus or a Gaius. But Paul said, there's only two brothers I baptized for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So you see, that's not the criteria of fellowship. I have, a, I, have a, I have several brethren, Church of the Brethren friends. I like those guys. They're, 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 you know, we know they're wrong in a couple places, right? They just don't know it yet. And we jab at each other occasionally. And one, one brother said he, he baptizes folks three times, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And he'll say, what do you think of that? And I say, I think first time you did it correct, the other two you rinsed. You know, you baptize enough folks, there is a scum on top of the water. Only pastors would know that. I mean, when you can see it, it's an oil slick sometimes. So rinse them off a couple more on the way out. I had one ask me what I thought about foot washing. Now they're talking as an ordinance of the church. And, and I must say they do it. In, I don't know ever. I'm not a brethren. I was raised up. My grandpa and my dad were both Baptist preachers. So uh, I, I was not raised up in a brethren church. But I do know that this brother, I know the, the men would only wash men's feet and women would only wash women's feet. And I tell you what, that's got to be something humbling to do. I've had a few wedding services where the couple chose as part of their wedding service to wash each other's feet. And that's a moving, humbling thing to see. When a husband and wife who are newly joined understand their role as a servant and they should wash each other's feet. My wife has never done that for me. <laughs> she has a conviction that I should wash my feet. And I do every day, God willing. Every day. But that's not the criteria. I asked Dr. John Rice one time so many years ago. Brother John, I had the privilege to pick him up a few times at the airport and drive him back up to the school. And he, he loved blueberry pie. And we'd stop at the clock, that 24-hour restaurant there. And um, I asked him one time about the sword. I said, Doc, I, I read in the sword, you know, sermons by Uncle Buddy Robinson, who was Nazarene, and Billy Sunday, who was Presbyterian. And I just didn't understand that. I was a li little bit still believing that Baptists were the only ones getting in. And I've learned since not all of them are going. Um, <laughs> but he said, son, Dr. Rice used to do this with his glasses, son. He said, I'm a friend of all who are a friend of Jesus indeed. And I'm determined to be that too. Men who preach Christ and Him crucified is the only hope of heaven. That's my goal. Let's be encouraged. I'm so tired of our, our camp being divided by things as insignificant as syncopated beats in music and hairstyles. And I know something about hair. I still have mine. <laughs> Praise the Lord, Tony. Praise the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> Pastor Marty's dad was a... Yeah. <laughs> You don't have to like me, but you've got to love me anyway. You, know, you don't get a choice about it. Dr. Holman, Pastor Marty's dad, was on our staff for about a year after he left Midwestern. And we still miss him. We talk about him all the time. We miss him. And, of course, Doc was bald, you know. And he said he had a conviction about hair. A man who, who doesn't have it on top should be allowed to grow it anywhere he can. <laughs> and so in his honor, I grew this a few years ago. It reminds me of Dr. Holman. Listen. That's not our criteria of division or judgment, but preaching Christ and Him crucified. Our time is short, and we must get back to the business we've been called to do. Right. Here's number four, because we have each other. Let me tell you a truth that our enemy tries to desperately keep concealed from you. You are not alone, and you're not the only one who ever had difficult seas to travel through. Unsaved people have as many difficulties, if not more, than the good members of my church family at Grace Baptist in Brunswick, Ohio. They still get sick. They still have issues with their kids. They still struggle. In fact, they struggle with some things that God has delivered us from. I, I meet so many people now who are struggling either themselves or with a family member through addictions of some kind or another. And it's epidemic in Medina County, Ohio. Epidemic. Struggling with life and the issues of life. So many good things God has delivered us from when he made us free from the bondage of sin. Do we still sin? Yes, of course we do. 
But I'm concerned it would grow to the place where we don't want to anymore. That's a good sign in life. When you get to the place where I don't want to, we have each other. I was telling folks Sunday about uh, how good it is. I only have one brother, one sibling. A younger brother lives in Nevada. I don't get to see him very much. But uh, Peter got pompous one day and was telling Jesus what all he'd given up. You know, Lord, I gave up my fishing business for you. I give up my home in Capernaum. We know that, that uh, he, could not have, he could not have been the first pope of the Roman Catholic Church because he had a mother-in-law. Amen. Now, a man to have a mother-in-law without having a wife is a fool. Uh, <laughs> I don't want no wife, but I want a mother-in-law. <laughs> Let's give him a little credit. Would you give him some credit? Remember, Jesus went into his home, and the Bible says his wife's mother lay sick of a fever. So he said, Lord, I've given up my home in Capernaum. I've given up my fishing business. and all. That I, that, Lord, what shall I have? And Jesus said, Peter, there is no man that has given up houses or lands or brothers or sisters who shall not in this life receive a hundredfold in the life to come, eternal, everlasting life. You're not going to lose by serving Jesus? Amen. I told folks, look around, look around here, Pastor Tony. Uh, you don't live in a house this big, do you? But you get, this is your house and all your brothers and sisters that come here. We looked around our house on Sunday. We've got two 16-foot screens on our, you talk about a big flat screen, there ain't nobody in Brunswick got a bigger flat screen than I do. And sometimes when nobody's there, we pipe into football games. And, well, not anymore. I'm protesting football officially right now. But the Indians are playing tonight and prayers would be appreciated <laughs> against the New York, well, in Cleveland, they have a different name for them, but I cannot use it in good company. I, I won't use it in good company. God has enlarged my coast with brothers and sisters, hundreds of them, and, and sweet people, and people have blessed my life. My wife and I both had our issues with, with cancer and, and, and come through those valleys. We had a little, our last little grandson was born early. Uh, Silas is about a year and a half old. He came on a Tuesday so unexpected, so early. He was born without a beating heart. And uh, uh, it's a, such a story. I wish I had time to tell it. I don't. My daughter-in-law is a NICU nurse. And she had gone down to the hospital because she wasn't feeling good. She was sick with the flu. And they said, come in and we'll give you IVs. And uh, she didn't check in. She's just one of their own. And so they plugged her in, Doc, you know, to just give her some fluids and help her feel better because Lori wouldn't take medicine being that close to delivery. And here she is laying in the hall in a bed taking fluids and suddenly an alarm goes off in the strap they had around her belly. And the doctor comes in, a good, wonderful lady doctor, and said, Lori, something's wrong. I don't understand what's wrong. They thought the cord was wrapped around his neck. But said, the baby's in great distress. We've got to take you into surgery now. You know where the surgical room was? Across the hall, right here. Turned the bed around, pushed her through. In 10 minutes, they had that baby boy out, and he was gone. His heart stopped. Handed him off to another doctor who revived him. And then we're, we're so fortunate where we live, Pastor Tony, in the shadow of the Cleveland Clinic. They sent a NICU unit out, and they picked him up, and he spent six weeks in the NICU. And if you saw him terrorizing the nursery last Sunday, you'd never think he had a problem. How good is God to us? Do we never have our issues and our, our worries and scares in life? No, we have them too. But we have one who said, I won't leave you through this. And I'm always in charge. And I'll bring it to good. You would not believe. There was a doctor there of another ethnicity and another religion who, who spent that night with me and my son outside while they were, this little boy was, was that night fighting for his life. And they finally took him off the steroids that night and said, he doesn't need him. He's improving so quickly. Wow. And that doctor was calling him the miracle baby. He said to, to the staff at the Fairview Hospital, the Cleveland Clinic Hospital, do you know where this boy's mama was when he was coming? She was outside the only place in the world where he could have survived right across from the delivery room. Do you think that was by accident? You know it wasn't. God said, I'll arrange things for you if you trust me. I'll take care of you. We're not the only ones who go through that kind of stuff. Satan has desired to have you, Peter. He wants to sift you. What is the sifting process? You pick up some grain and you, you crush it. You know what you're trying to do to the grain? Remove the heart, right? Remove the heart, the heart of the grain. Grind you to take your heart, to remove your heart and leave you just an empty husk. But Jesus said, Peter, it's okay. I've prayed for you. Can you imagine what that's like? The one who ever lives to make intercession for us who stands at the right hand of the Father and says to our enemy, the opposer, the one who stands against us, as you leave him alone, as he did with Job at one point. Leave him alone. You're done with him. He's mine. But let me tell you another reason. Number five, 
because we're better equipped than any generation of believers before us to do what we've been given to do. How awesome is that to think that Dr. Martin can take an electronic Wi-Fi stethoscope and treat a patient 3,000 miles away. Last Sunday, we, we live stream our service at 9.45 on Sunday morning. And uh, we've got now this audience of people that, that we can see when they log in. And, and sometimes we love their comments. And when I don't love their comments, I tell the guys upstairs, disable comments. <laughs> but everybody, everybody, of course, loves our <laughs> They make nice comments, mostly. So We broadcast. We've been broadcasting on the radio every Sunday morning for more than 30 years. And, and I often think, what could Paul have done with that stuff? You know, the internet, the, the live stream. The, 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 he, he covered the known world, his known world in shoe leather. What could he have done with the technology of today? Yeah, I think often of Gideon. And a long story, I, I know you know it. You know how preaching has changed, Brother Marine, over the years, for me anyway, having spent my whole life in one church. Forty years ago when I was preaching, I could say to my Sunday morning crowd, now you know the story of Gideon, and everybody would go, yeah, I know that. And today I'll say, you know the story of Gideon, right? And, and some of the crowd's going, who's Gideon? We have become so biblically illiterate. Technically, we have, really, honestly. Now you have to tell the story before you can make a point. But I'm going to assume you know it. Please say you know it. Nod your head. You know it. Good. I, know, I know you know it. Well, how God trimmed his army down, gave him 300. God put him to that little dip test, you know, that, that watching for the enemy test. And God said, okay, those, those are your guys. Can you imagine how Gideon felt when he started with thousands and now God says, you can have 300 against the Midianites. Oh, Lord, it's a suicide mission. Well, he must have been Baptist to feel that way, right? It's a suicide mission. And then the Lord said, okay, no weapons. What do you mean no weapons? Clay pot with a lamp inside and trumpets, that's all you get. But what did God do with clay pots and trumpets? Wow, defeated the enemy. What can God do with the tools and instruments he's placed in our hands if we just become like Gideon's 300 and trust him that much? That's what we're missing, the 300, the trust of the 300. Now, there's one more. We can be encouraged because our Lord is returning on schedule. Right on time. The day in which we live is dark. But our Lord is alive and has promised to come back on time. When I was a boy growing up, I loved to read Hardy Boy mysteries. Anybody else? Hardy Boys? Good. There are some saved folks here, some saved men. <laughs> Nancy Drew? I was hoping the men would not raise their hands. <laughs> My wife read Little House in the Prairie, Nancy Drew. Reading was an escape, you know, and, and, and a joy. And we only had where I grew up, we had two TV channels. Uh, and we grew up in the, I grew up in the mountains. We had, we had television, black and white. We had an antenna, back porch of the house, about 20 feet above the house. And my dad, my dad loved Bonanza. Sunday night was Bonanza. And my dad would hope sometimes that nobody wanted to hang around after church and talk and make him miss Bonanza. Very spiritually deep was my dad, of course. And, but we'd rush home, usually next door, because I grew up in parsonages. And next door, and my dad would send me out, because you never got both channels at the same antenna leverage. You know, they had to turn it for one or the other. And my dad would send me out back, and we had this, this communication. But it's so easy if we had cell phones, it could do like my grandkids, who text each other from the balcony to the downstairs. But, but he'd yell for me. You know, I'd put my hands on it, and I'd turn it, and he'd say, there, son, right there, hold it. And I'd let go, and it'd go snowy. You know why? Because I was the ground. My feet. And, and, and I'd say, but dad, it, I didn't move it. You had to move it. No, dad, I just like, well, then stand there and hold it while I watch Bonanza. <laughs> I grew up an abused child. <laughs> the man that I love to read Hardy Boy Mysteries. The Secret of Pirate's Hill, The Clue in the Embers, and all those wonderful books. And sometimes, honestly, I'd be reading that Hardy Boy Mystery, and, and I'd wonder if Frank and Joe were going to live. I mean, are you going to make it, guys? You know what I'd do? I'd go near. I wouldn't read the last, last page or so, but I'd go into that last chapter. And if I saw Frank and Joe there, I'd go, well, at least they live. <laughs> when things around me get a little dark 
and we all can suffer from that impending darkness overwhelms us sometimes and we look at the world and we watch the news and we get overwhelmed with how culture has changed in the last 10 years. I go to the 19th chapter of the book of the Revelation and I see that one when John said, I saw heaven open and a rider come on a white horse who is called faithful and true. His vesture is dipped in blood because there's still power in the blood and on his thigh is his name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords and he comes back just in time. And I get encouraged. But then I think tonight of the urgency of the hour. Let me shock you for a minute. Can I shock you for a moment? You are older than you've ever been. Oh, doesn't that hurt? Well, let me see if I can encourage encourage you now. You will never be this young again. (laughs) But there's urgency in what we do. Because we all have expiration dates. God knows our span, our arrival, our departure. We don't, but God does. And my dad died at 40, age 45, suddenly, unexpectedly, visiting my home in Michigan, died of a massive heart attack. My grandpa is 61, who pastored Louisville Baptist Temple outside of Canton, Ohio. I'm the oldest powers man so far to live, and I plan to keep doing that. Me and the Lord, we're working this out. But there's an urgency. And lately, I've been feeling like I've never felt it before. I heard so many years ago a story of a family who had taken vacation on the California coast. And an uh, awful storm came up right along the, the sea coast there. As often is the case, whether it's, it's the Atlantic coast or the Pacific coast, folks, after a big storm that churns the ocean, they love to go out with their kids and find shells. And so this family had left their hotel room and they were walking the ocean and, and they were picking up shells and the kids were having such a great time, but they noticed an old man with a cane and a bucket with a little bit of seawater in it. And he's hobbling along and he would stop and he'd lean his cane on this hand and he'd reach down and he'd pick up a starfish and he'd put it in the bucket. And then he'd walk with great effort to another one and he'd pick up another one. And when he had three or four of them, he'd go over to the, to the waves and he'd reach in the bucket and he'd pitch them in. And then he'd start again. And they were everywhere, everywhere. And so the family walked up and they watched him and they talked to him. And dad said, uh, sir, what, what are you doing? He said, uh, I'm trying to pick these starfish up and get them back into the ocean. And the fellow said, uh, look at them. Well, he said, as far as we can see, there's starfish in the sand, and, and there, there must be hundreds and hundreds of them. You won't make any difference. And as he reached in the bucket and pitched another in, he said, it made a difference to that one. Amen. We get overwhelmed sometimes with the billions of people on planet Earth who don't know Jesus. And you and I are not going to win the masses of them, but we can one at a time. We can make a difference in the next one to get saved.